everybody for coming. We're very excited today to have Alicia talking about her research in nuclear engineering. And as always, these are informal talks, so feel free to jump in with questions as you have them. We'll also have time for questions at the end, and we will have snacks and treats and wine afterwards in the bar. We can talk about this more. Okay, I'm working on um, evaluations in the nuclear air breaking combined cycle um, and doing ample and energy technologies in engineering. And um, just like Courtney said, feel free to interrupt if there's anything at all that you don't understand that I talked about. If there's anything you want me to define, just um, So I'm just going to give you like a quick background of nuclear energy um, motivation for the project. Um, I will talk about what's currently done in nuclear technology, nuclear power, and then introduce the NECC nuclear air breaking combined cycle, which is a hybrid of a nuclear reactor and um, more conventional fossil fuel technology. And then I'll show you some preliminary results and then what I'll be doing for the remainder of my thesis. So um, I thought a quick history would be useful to help people understand um, how nuclear power developed. Uh, so Rutherford developed the model of the atom and then he came to Cambridge, to Cavendish, um, and started his lab here. Chadwick, under him, discovered the neutron. Um, and from this discovery, Fermi figured out that we can bombard neutrons at other atoms to make them split. This is called fission. And when fission occurs, huge amounts of energy are released. And this is like the basic principle behind nuclear energy. Um, Brecher, also in Rutherford's lab, uh, discovered that plutonium can be made from uranium, and this was really important for the Manhattan Project in the US, which was to develop the atomic bomb. They were trying to figure out how to create large amounts of plutonium. So after the war, um, the first civil reactor was built in Britain, to mainly to generate more plutonium, because plutonium is a waste product of fission of uranium. So um, yeah, this is the first, the first ever reactor that was connected to the grid. So the main idea in energy is low carbon, right? Low carbon, efficient, reliable. And as we um, incorporate more nuclear and renewable technologies into our grids, we have to figure out how to make them flexible because they're not as flexible and um, like you can't generate energy on demand in the amounts that you need with these technologies the way you can with fossil fuels. So this is a challenge. We have to figure out how to have dispatchable or on-demand electricity generation because supply or supply and demand have to be matched at any point in time. So this is a, a snapshot of um, actual demand in the UK from a few weeks ago. And it fluctuates throughout the day and throughout the week. So our power supplies also have to fluctuate to match that. Um, another challenge in nuclear power is that the reactors are really expensive to build. Um, so this is this makes it difficult for some countries to add nuclear power to their energy mix. So this is what um, most reactors that are operating today look like, not really, but a cartoon version of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the reaction, the nuclear reaction in red and yellow generates lots of heat that turns water into steam, and the steam drives turbines, which generate electricity. Um, most nuclear power operates at a constant base load, which, as I said, is a problem because we need variable electricity generation. And the reason <coughs> it's hard to what's called load follow um, with nuclear power, well, there are many reasons. Um, firstly, the high capital cost of building the nuclear power plants um, favors full load operations because you want to operate, you want to generate as much electricity as you can to generate revenue to make up for those high capital costs. Um, flexible operation can also increase wear and tear on the components, um, and maintenance downtime is really expensive in nuclear power as well because you're trying to run the reactor at full operation to generate revenue. Um, load following is possible 
with most types of operating with most types of plants that are operating today but um, it's quite limited in terms of how quickly you can vary the power output and also how frequently throughout the day you can do this so most plants in France do load follow but they can only switch like once or twice a day um, there are also lots of really complex feedback mechanisms to maintain steady state operation in a reactor and steady state operation is crucial for safety and to avoid like accidentally shutting down. You have to sustain the, the nuclear chain reaction. So it's quite complex to, to change this output and keep it operating at steady state. And then the regulatory challenges um, are, are basically an issue for lots of things in nuclear power um, advancement because regulations are very, very strict. The nuclear industry is typically over-regulated um, because of safety concerns, but also because policymakers don't fully understand a lot of the risks associated. So anyways, load falling requires explicit approval and um, the regulations may require additional components to be added or design changes or retrofits, things like that, and that can increase costs. Okay. So this is why most plants operate at a constant output. So the nuclear air break and combined cycle is a possible solution to this. Um, the schematic shows the reactor, which is an FHR, I'll go into in a minute. Um, and instead of creating heat that turns water into steam, the reactor heats air via heat exchangers, and then the hot air goes into a natural gas turbine which is a, um, well, natural gas is very efficient. It's quite clean um, compared to other fossil fuels and uh, natural gas turbines are very good for generating variable power very rapidly. And then the exhaust from the gas turbine is still hot enough to generate steam that can either be used directly in industrial processes or to generate even more electricity. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, so none of the steam is being directly generated from the FHR that right. goes to the compressor. It's all going straight to the gas turbine. Yes, and this is what, um, like natural gas plants, that, natural gas combined cycles that operate today and are complete power plants in themselves. This is the principle: the natural gas exhaust is used to generate steam. That's what combined cycle means in that. So, sorry, I don't, I've never heard of natural gas before. But does that mean it's making natural gas or it's using it's It's using natural, natural gas. gas. It's, it's methane or methane. So um, I'm putting, so I have like two energy sources mm -hmm. and I'm coupling them. Yeah. And that's better, why? Sorry. Uh, I will explain in a minute. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah so you're using the, the heat from the reactor with natural gas, which is a combustible fuel. Natural gas, or you need a turbine? Uh, natural, natural gas is burned through a turbine. Usually, a natural gas turbine is a very efficient way of converting fuel to electricity. Um, uh, and it achieves really rapid power variations. Um, so, it's like with turbine, you are harvesting with, with power? Sort of. So, it's, yeah, I should have had a picture, but it's. It's, they're really enormous devices. Okay. And um, they first compress the air. I'll show a thermodynamic diagram, but it's not a picture of an actual gas turbine. They compress the air, um, and then the air is heated, and this hot compressed air drives a turbine, drives turbine blades, and that generates electricity. So it's not burning natural gas? Yes. Okay. Yeah, when you, when you burn the natural gas, it adds heat and pressure to the already compressed and hot air. Uh, and then this hot compressed air drives the turbine. Mm -hmm. okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, so essentially it's just adding the extra heat so that the efficiency is higher, right? Yeah. So is there any heat sink so com uh, com compared to like conventional uh, nuclear plants? Like is there any heat sink in terms of like emitting waste heat? Or is all the heat, because I don't see a single, I don't see like, um, a cooling tower or anything? No, because, yeah, so I'll go into this as well in a minute, but so the, the, the FHR heat. uses a liquid coolant that it's really efficient and it just cycles through and it sh like 
it exchanges the heat with the air and goes back in to the reactor at like the ideal operating temperature. So this is what's really cool about the system is that the temperatures from the reactor couple really well to the temperatures needed to operate gas turbine. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are some advantages of coupling that, which we, we already touched on just now. But the, the FHR, the reactor, provides the base load heat, so it's still operating at the constant output like traditional nuclear plants. Um, and this base load heat enables the natural gas turbine to operate really, really efficiently, and even more, it's even more agile than a standalone gas turbine because um, if you have a cold start um, with like large power demand fluctuations, you might start from zero. And in a cold start, um, it takes some time to warm up, and it's less efficient at the cold start. But in this case, there is no cold start because it always has heat coming in from the reactor. Does that make sense? And then on the, the gas turbine side, um, this provides the variable power. So you have constant power from the reactor and then variable power to match your demand load um, from the natural gas. So the amount of natural gas you inject determines how much power you get out from the system. And because you can generate variable power, you have higher plant revenues, which helps to address the issue of nuclear plants having really high capital costs. So it's a better model in terms of efficiency and economics. Does that make sense? Um, so this is a TS diagram, which is kind of a, a standard thing used in thermodynamic analysis. And what's important is really the, the temperature axis. Um, S is entropy, which if you don't know what it is, it basically entropy is always increasing with time. Any process that you do is going to increase entropy. So you can also think of this sort of like a time axis. For them to scale. So um, the compression, as I said, in the, in the gas turbine, you have first a compression stage, and then you heat the air, either, well, both with the, the heat from the reactor, so that heats it partway, and then the natural gas turbine is used to heat it the rest of the way to that peak temperature. And so obviously here, you're using the natural gas for less of it, which means you're using less fuel to reach the same temperatures, so that's higher efficiency and less money spent for fuel. Does that make sense? Hold up. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Are you spending a lot of money on putting a power plant somewhere to then put a bit of fuel? Yes. So this is what my project has to do. OK. Um, so this is another little schematic of the reactor, which we can I can address questions about that later if you have them or whenever, um, if you want to know about the different components and parts of the reactor. But basically the important parts are the fuel, instead of in normal conventional reactors that we use today, fuel is contained in rods that are inserted into the reactor. But in this system, there are little pebbles of fuel that are about the size of golf balls. And this they're coated with graphite, which um, helps with various aspects of um, the nuclear reaction. That gets quite technical. But these pebbles are advantageous because they enable more passive safety uh, mechanisms to be incorporated. So your risk of a meltdown is like super, super low, if not zero, because you don't need like human intervention if something goes wrong, because the system will basically shut itself down. Um, question? Okay. <laughs> um, the, pebble, the pebble bed fuel also enables continuous refueling. So in these, um, reactors with fuel rods, you have to, well, some, and some of them allow like online refueling, which means that you can refuel, you can put in new fuel while the reactor is still running, but that still has to be done like at intervals, right, as necessary. But with the pebble bed system, you're just constantly like taking out pebbles that are depleted that have no more fuel in them and adding in new ones. So there's, it, it's like a very even um, refueling cycle. Sorry. Now, when you're saying fuel, do you mean, do you mean natural gas or do you mean uh, uranium. uranium? Yeah, yeah. so it's uranium. There are little uranium pellets coated with graphite, which is a moderator okay. um, that helps with the, the neutron speed, basically. And so besides, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but besides safety, is pulling safety away in terms of operation, what's the benefit of this, of 
What's the benefit of a FHR over a PWR? Um, it's quite efficient. Um, it's it works well with modular systems, small modular systems. So that was why it was initially developed. Yeah. And and this graphite coated um, pebble bed system is well. That fuel is the same type of fuel that's used with high temperature gas reactors. So like has already been developed and shown to be really effective. So efficiency. Because we we you yeah. know about this technology. Mm -hmm. So cool reactors for a while. Mm -hmm. So the reason for using for this specific application is efficiency? Yes, but yeah. But this is also quite different from molten salt reactors because in those sorry we're getting a bit technical here. Um, in those the fuel is dissolved in the coolant. Hmm. Whereas in this one the pebbles are like floating through the coolant. Okay. okay. <laughs> So yeah, as we were just talking about, there's a liquid fluoride salt coolant, um, which is pretty cool because it not only has very good coolant properties, so if you think about um, your the radiator in your car, the coolant that's used has to have various properties to ensure like reliable operation. So for one, it shouldn't corrode the parts of the engine. Um, it should have an operating temperature such that it is neither a solid or a gas at and any of the temperatures that your car might be operating at. So that's why we put antifreeze in our coolant because if it's a solid in the winter, it's not cooling, it's not flowing through the system and cooling the engine. And if it becomes a gas, it's not removing heat efficiently. So it's the same type of concepts applied here for the, for the coolant that you're trying to choose um, for your reactor. So different types of coolants uh, include water, um, heavy water um, and types of gas, helium. So they they all sort of incorporate or complement the reactor technology and configuration in different ways. I don't know if everyone knows what heavy water is. I don't know how to explain. But what is it? Just H. Yeah, so it's water with one extra neutron, right? One or two, it could be either yeah. one. Um, it's an isotope of water. Um, right, so as I said a few minutes ago, the, the temperatures at which this coolant operates and, and the reactor operates couples really well, or let me say it a different way, the coolant is a great way to link the reactor and the gas turbine because of its ideal operating temperature range. So the reactor is operating at certain temperatures, and then the coolant has like happy temperatures that are between its melting and its boiling point. And these correspond really well to the reactor temperatures and also really well to the temperatures that you would want to be injecting into the natural gas turbine. And that will hopefully become more clear in a minute why you have why you have to control the temperatures that you're putting into the gas turbine. Um, and then a, a gas turbine uses what's called an air braking power cycle, which is just a word for the type of thermodynamic cycle um, that it's using. And you can use an off-the-shelf gas turbine with the system, which is really useful with just minor modifications to allow the preheating of the air from the, sorry, from the um, reactor coolant. Um, so we can go through this diagram really quickly, actually. This is this is the part of the reactor that the fuel and the coolant is flowing through. So you have like little pebbles floating in here in the coolant, and the pebbles are fed in through the bottom, and they float upwards through the coolant. So that's like one passive aspect of the system. And then control rods are inserted this way to control rods basically slow down the reaction so you can insert them further in if you're trying to make the reaction slower or pull them partially out to increase the rate of reaction. And this is how steady state is controlled. So like I said earlier, it's quite complicated. You don't just press some buttons and the power output changes. It's um, There are a lot of complicated physical mechanisms that control the power output. The control rod say is what absorb neutron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. OK, so this, oh, just, mm -hmm. can you go back? Wait, yep. In terms of scale mm -hmm. of one of these, yeah. I so this is a modular, that. this is like a small modular unit that's three and a half meters across and I think it's like 12 meters high. Okay, you just have like 
So yeah, so this this PD FHR, sorry I didn't say the definition, it's a pebble bed fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor. Um, so all of these aspects are important. We just talked about them, the pebble bed, the, the coolant part, and the high temperatures, which coupled, couple really well to the gas turbine. So it's being developed by a university consortium in the US, UC Berkeley, MIT, and University of Wisconsin. And the way they've configured it or designed it, like it's not being built physically yet, it's just being designed, um, is to have 12 reactors linked. Um, the 12 of those. Mm -hmm. And modularity is a kind of a hot topic in nuclear energy right now because it avoids high capital costs. You can like piece together as many units as you need for a specific application for the power level that's needed. Mm -hmm. So does that mean one of these generates a lot less power than a PWR module at the same size? Uh, I don't actually know the numbers on a PWR module. Because most uh, nuclear power plants I know are probably like one or two reactors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It could be smaller. I know that, so the power output from this is about 100 megawatts for one unit. Or no, it's two it's two hundred and thirty megawatts, thermal megawatts, and then like a hundred megawatts of electricity that you can get out. What does that mean? Like can you convert that to like something that someone who doesn't do anything? Oh right what do you think? Uh like a normal, 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 like normal, normal Yeah, normal PR. It's like three hundred, right? Yeah, more or less. What is that? Yeah. Is everyone how <laughs> Households for a year. Like household, like household, like, like, like about small city, city. city. Yeah, like a city. A city. Yeah. Like well, for a hundred, maybe like a small city. Because a so like a, a like you see a wind turbine that's like one megawatt. Yeah. Is like like the biggest blocks. wind turbines that are planned for the future are five megawatts. At uh, capacity, so if it's yeah. like spinning really fast, like it was supposed to be doing. Produce one megawatt. Oh, I guess a coal power plant is like 600 megawatts, right? And yeah, so that, that typically much. powers the city. Just in terms of megawatts. I don't know, like it's hard to compare the scale. But usually, you know, like that's just like like usually we talk about like cities or 50 about watts or something. Right? Hours. What? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> These pebbles, when they float up, do they completely decompose by the time they get to No, it takes like one and a half years for one pebble to be depleted. Okay. And depletion means like all, so like Yeah, all of the uranium ones. has been like fissioned into right. something else, so it's no longer fuel, it's it's a product of the reaction. So it's like, if you have this graphite coating mm -hmm. and it's just solid uranium. Um, I think it's, I think they're like little, what? It becomes lead, no, is that not at all? No, it, well, it depends on the type of uranium and how it's enriched, but it, it becomes plutonium often. What do you do with it when it gets plutonium? Nuclear waste? You, what? Nuclear waste? Yeah, so so then it's spent yeah, nuclear fuel, it's nuclear waste, and, waste and you have to contain it um, and bury it, usually. It can be repro it can be like recycled, but it's pretty expensive and it's not usually done today because uranium is still available and cheap enough. Is it you make at all dangerous? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it at all dangerous? Yeah. Yes. Very. So I mean, that's yeah. not very. But like, I know that they like stuck stick this up in mountains. But like, at what point is it going to become a problem? Um. So the the thing about spent nuclear fuel is that the amounts of it are really really small for the amount of energy that you get out. Um. And it would be quite easy to just have like one huge burial site per country or whatever and stick everything in there and like it wouldn't even be that big. It would be like the size of a landfill or something. Um, and there are like a lot of new reactor technologies are looking at ways to decrease the amount of spent fuel like some of the spent fuel is like reused in the system and things like that. So um, that's a really important topic in nuclear technology. But there's one more question, but um, how do you identify which of the, of the but it's continuous refueling, how do you identify which of the pellets are depleted? Um, so I don't know a lot about this, but there's like a little like sensor system on the side, a little like box that it goes through and it like measures how much uranium is in it. Mm -hmm. And if it has, still has enough, then it like goes back into the system and if it doesn't, it's dumped out. Hmm. Who makes those pebbles? 
Um, there, <laughs> there are companies that that just make nuclear fuel. The kids at uh, Charles Xavier's college. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if I finished answering whoever's question it was, but I don't think it's like solid uranium and then graphite outside. They're like little, um, like little beads of uranium inside. And I think it's actually a graphite core as well, and then like little beads of uranium all over, and then graphite on the outside too. Because we need like a really tiny amount of uranium, or like a really tiny pellet of uranium contains as much as like a ton of coal in terms of energy content. So this is why the spent fuel, the waste that comes out of nuclear plants is not nearly as much as people think. And what's the role of graphite again? You said as a moderator. What is that? Um, so a moderator slows down the nuclear. Okay, when. It doesn't this uh, control rods do that as well. What? Don't, don't the control rods slow it down as well? So why yeah, two but. Mechanisms? Well, no, control rods absorb. This is getting like quite technical into nuclear physics. But the control rods absorb the neutrons completely, so then they're not um, yeah. like initiating fission in other, okay, so what happens is you have to start off with some neutrons or you, you do something that starts the nuclear reaction. And then as atoms split, they turn into other atoms of other elements, but they also release some neutrons. So then those neutrons go on to split other atoms and so on. This is the nuclear chain reaction. And this is what is meant by steady state operation. When you have as many neutrons being created from those reactions as the neutrons that are like dying or don't have enough energy anymore. So if you have like less than steady state operation, your react reactor goes into shutdown. And if you have more than that, you could have a nuclear meltdown. So it's really, really important. Um, so anyways, you have these neutrons that are created from each of these atoms splitting. And you usually want them to go on and split other atoms. But this works better when the neutrons are slower. So moderators slow down the neutrons to increase the chances of them splitting other atoms. But the control rods absorb the neutrons so that they're no longer in the system at all. Okay. So the moderator slows down. Yes, essentially. Um, it also plays some other roles. <laughs> Any other questions about fuel or anything? You mentioned it was safer, like less likely to, to melt down. Mm -hmm. What's the reason for that? Um, so if so, the fuel can actually melt. Fuel is contained in like fuel rods, and the reaction can like occur through these rods. But if the fuel melts, then the reactions are no longer controlled in the way that the system was designed to control the way that the neutrons are like interacting with the matter. So if the fuel melts, um, like you don't know what could happen. Usually it's bad. But <laughs> um, sometimes it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so with the pebble bed, with the, this pebble type fuel, the melting temperatures are so high that it would like never be an issue. Wasn't it also, it's not pressurized, so it just kind of like melt into a pool on the bottom, whereas the PWR would like blow up. Yeah. Um, so what James is referring to is a pressurized water reactor, and you pressurize the water so that it doesn't boil, because like I said, if your coolant boils, it's no longer cooling your system. So by pressurizing water, you raise the boiling temperature, but pressurizing systems has all kinds of complications, and if you have a leak, that's really bad, and if you, I don't know, if like, something blows up, whatever, and there's also a lot more wear and tear on the components, so it tends to be more expensive to build. Um, you have to replace components more often. So um, yeah, nuclear power has been kind of getting away from pressurized water, but the advantage of pressurized water reactors is that they're more compact. So they can be used in submarines, which is why they were developed. Yeah. They used to do nuclear power plants in submarines? And they were what? So they, so they, they have two orange per year per year. Yeah, aren't the yeah. nuclear subs exclusively nuclear power? There's no yeah, way to so like burn. We used to do a mix of diesel. Well, no, there's a diesel generator in case it goes out, but we use exclusive nuclear power for the subs. Yeah, so the history of how like different reactor types developed initially is really interesting. I really like reading about it. So 
PWRs were developed in the U.S. because the U.S. Navy needed a way to power submarines so that the submarines don't have to like resurface to charge their batteries because then your enemy sees you. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> nuclear reactors and submarines are a huge game changer for the Navy. Um, and then, like I said, the the first like civil reactors were built in the in the U.K. because they wanted to have their own nuclear bombs. So they were like, we need to generate lots of plutonium. And it's kind of it's kind of a game changer for the Navy just because you could just be in the water for like four or five months compared yeah. to diesels which need air, so you'd have to be on top of the surface. Yeah. And also it's kind of like it's kind of a, so I when we're ever started this program, it's kind of been showing that you can have underwater nuclear reactors and shows like the safety because there hasn't been a nuclear accident on moving vessels in a wartime environment ever. And so it kind of shows people kind of get disillusioned by the the safety and this, you get scared of nuclear power, but it kind of just, one data point showing how safe it can really be. And reactors are also used, like tiny reactors are also used in aircraft. Yeah. Which is why this molten salt coolant was actually developed. Right. So gas turbines are used not just for generating electricity, but also for like they're in airplanes. That's what drives or powers airplanes and jets. And so they wanted to find a way to couple nuclear reactors to gas turbines. There's no um, current operational. No, I don't think so. But this is why. So this coolant was, and this like FHR system was actually developed a really long time ago, but it was just never commercialized. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, let's talk about temperatures. Um, so these are some preliminary results I have that show a natural gas to electricity conversion efficiency of around 68%, which agrees really well with literature. Um, in a standard gas turbine, the efficiency is about 60%, or, well, can be even lower, like 55 to 60%. Uh, oh yeah, 57% for this particular model that um, the PBFHR is being designed with in the US. So anyways, this is a thermodynamic model. Um, it's the, the TS diagram that I showed you earlier, but with more stages that I'll explain in a minute. Um, and then this is, this is the TS diagram, and this is um, like a cartoon drawing of the components of the gas turbine. Um, so let's just go through it. So the air first comes in through a compressor, um, which compresses the air, so it's, it comes out at higher pressure and temperature. Um, so we go from ambient temperature to like 420. And then it's going to go through one of these air heaters, so it's a heat exchanger through which the reactor coolant is heating up the air in the gas turbine. So that heats it up to about 670 degrees. And then it goes through its first turbine, which is like the opposite of a compressor. The air expands through it, it turns blades, and generates electricity this way. It converts the mechanical energy via generator. Um, so when it expands, the temperature also drops a little bit. And then, oops, then we heat it up a second time through a second uh, air heater to the same temperature as before, 670. And, and then gas is added. So actually, we could just stop there if we were operating at base load. We wouldn't add any natural gas, and then it would come through another turbine at that temperature. But when you add natural gas to get to your peak temperature of around 1200, but it depends on the system, um, you're, as I showed you before, you're using less natural gas because the air is already hot from the reactor coolant air heater. And then finally it goes through a second turbine um, and generates electricity this way, but it's also coming out at like a pretty high temperature, so the exhaust can be used to generate steam. So the higher the temperature that it comes out at, the, the better it is for generating even more electricity. So it's like a multi-stage multi-stage? Yeah, yeah, so this is called a two-stage. Um, it would be a gas turbine, if it, just a regular gas turbine, if it didn't have those two air heaters. Um, but this is what a two-stage gas turbine, which is most like big commercial gas turbines used for electricity generation, that's how they operate. And what's about this preliminary? It sounds like 
the pretty much name what you're talking about? <laughs> well, this is just a small like part of my project. Um, it's a step. I'll explain the other steps later. So you modeled this, or you went and put the thermometer there, or something? No, I, I modeled <laughs> it yeah. using so the model, the gas turbine model, for just a plain gas turbine was like has been used by the department for a really long time. It's used in undergraduate labs and stuff, and then I modified it to add in the air heaters. So are they planning on using the exhaust to boil water for the steam for the Yeah. And so is that 68.6% taking account of that? Or is that no, that's, that's, okay, so that, that um, efficiency is just the energy that comes in from the natural gas, or sorry, the energy that comes out from the turbine divided by the energy that goes in from the natural gas. So just this part divided by this oh, part. Oh, the natural, oh, so it's yeah. just the natural gas. So is it yes. taking account the extra help from? No, because. So wouldn't it be much lower then? Yeah. Well, it's it's hard to combine these different types of efficiencies. Yeah. Right? Because this is thermal energy, like it's just heat, whereas this is like fuel, and you can calculate like the energy contained in that fuel directly because all of it is burned and turned into energy, but the the thermal efficiency of a reactor is kind of like a different measure. Okay, but it's kind of hard to compare 57% to 68.6. Well, this is all, that's also the natural gas efficiency. No, that's what I mean though. Yeah, that's a direct comparison. Yeah, I, yeah, but that's also, yeah, but you kind of disregard the extra help from the, the um, nuclear power plant. Mm. So sort of, you did, yeah. you said that. Yes. It's kind of hard. But the point yeah. is that the natural gas gets used, gets used, so 70% of that gas gets turned into electricity versus 60%. Yeah. Like, regardless, that natural gas is being used more efficiently than the other natural gas. Yeah. So, yeah, so th this type of system would be useful when natural gas prices are a lot higher. Okay. Um, so you're trying to, and also just if you're trying to go low carbon and use less fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was, didn't know what the 68 point. Yeah, okay. yeah, I've been thinking about this too, like how to make it a fair comparison, but that's what we're doing. What? Nothing. <laughs> well, could you just do the, of the whole system with the efficiency? Well, the yeah, but there, it's yeah. difficult, yeah, it's hard to compare because it's like, in the case of the, the unmodified gas turbine, you're saying like, this is the amount of electricity that I got out compared to the amount of fuel that I put in. But when you have like combined heat sources, like in the NACC, it's it's not a measure of how efficiently you're using your fuel. It's still a measure of heat out over heat in, or electricity out over electricity in. So in, yeah. in that sense, it, it is a meaningful comparison, but it doesn't tell you about how you're using your fuel really, which is like an important Thing for Do you sounds like you know the heat out versus thing. heat in, and it's much less efficient for the whole system. For the whole system, no, it's no, it's still better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So sixty eight would be good to know then. Yeah. And so the sixty eight point six is just that last turbine. Yeah, it's just it's this, not the middle one. The this orange line and this purple line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this purple line is coming from like the reactor heat, yeah. right? <coughs> And then, of course, you have to use some energy to drive your compressor, too. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, so that for that, count. yeah, like, the entire cycle efficiency is useful. But I'm still working on, yeah. like, how to generate those efficiencies and how to compare them. But it'd be pretty similar to combined coal and gas plants. So there's already that methodology. Yeah, but there. that's still, like, that's still combustible fuel and combustible fuel. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anything else to say, I guess. Are there any other questions about the stack? Okay. Um, so that's what I've done so far. I adapted this model from engineering to make this thermodynamic representation of the, the system. Um, now I'm working on developing an economic model of the system because, like we talked about earlier, the economics of building nuclear reactors and natural gas versus electricity prices are really important for determining what type of power plant you should build. 
um, because if it's not competitive, it's not like people aren't going to pay the electricity prices just because it's really clean. Well, sometimes they do, but only to a certain point. So, um, so it has to be competitive. The, yeah, the cost revenue model that I'll be using will basically take into account the cost of building the nuclear plant and operating it, and then the cost of natural gas and electricity. So the cost of electricity is your revenue stream if you're a plant operator. Um, and then I'll use those models to evaluate the performance of NECC um, in, a, in different operation scenarios. So sometimes you do have just baseload operation, like at night usually is when it occurs, um, and you just have like your air conditioners and your refrigerators and things like that are on, but you don't have those, those extra things that add on to that base. So then um, as people start to wake up, you're turning on lights and cooking breakfast and things like that, so then you have intermediate load. And, um, well, actually, mornings are usually when you have peak load, mornings and evenings when people are home cooking and things like that. And then in the middle of the day, you have intermediate load. But this totally depends on, like, the city and what types of industries are there, how many factories, things like that. So, um, so in order to, like, evaluate the system using the models I have, I need to have, like, representative cycles of those different scenarios, baseload, intermediate, and peak, um, sort of like standard cycles, or at least something that I know is uh, reasonable, a reasonable like representation of an actual city or something, uh, an energy grid. So I have to like find this if it's out there or develop something that's reasonable. So that I think is gonna be a pretty big challenge. Um, then once I use these things to evaluate the system, I'll try to compare it with alternative methods of low carbon on-demand electricity generation. So um, I wouldn't be comparing it to like conventional base load nuclear plants. I might be able to compare it to load falling plants, which like I said, they're, they're a lot in France, um, but they have limitations and they probably aren't as efficient or economical as this, but that's what I hope to prove. Other types are like the natural gas combined cycle plant and uh, energy storage. There are some energy storage technologies, which actually, if you added energy storage onto this, onto the NAC system, it makes it even more attractive because then you can like combine renewables with the base load system really well. So the issue with renewable energy is that it's intermittent, it's unpredictable. So you may not be able to like generate wind power when you have peak load. But with with storage systems, you could use technologies that provide base load without any emissions and technologies that come on and off in an uncontrolled manner, but by storing it, you can use it when you need it. So this is just a step towards that, that zero carbon energy world, hopefully. Or low carbon at least. So I think it's really cool to study nuclear energy at Cambridge because nuclear physics was born in Cavendish, and I'm studying like next year energy nuclear nuclear technologies in the very beautiful engineering department. <laughs> <laughs> is a PhD student who's been helping me discover the joys of Fortran, and I'm sponsored by the Winston Churchill Foundation. Any questions? So, kind of the benefits are pretty like apparent, right? Because we already have nuclear technology, we already have combined, or we already have like gas technology, gas turbine technology, and essentially all we're using is the waste heat that would have otherwise been just lost and using it to help increase the efficiency of the gas turbine. Well, it's not the waste heat. It's all the heat from yeah. the reactor. I thought there was one of the turbines was run purely by heat of the the air from the. Do you go back to the original or which, go back to the schematic? Which, which waste heat? Or, waste or, or, heat or, from what? The middle one. The the first turbine. This one. This one. Yeah, isn't that from just the the nuclear plant? Yeah. Yeah. So right. So. But her so point is that the nuclear plant doesn't generate any other electricity. Yeah, like it's related, just all of the, the coolant is coming out at like 700 degrees and 
And there's so much of it that you can have two air heaters, so like half of it goes in one, half goes in the other, and you heat up air simultaneously in both at the same temperatures. Wait, so those two terms are, explain it, what? Okay, so you, you start off at like 420 after your compressor, Yes. And then you heat with your first air heater, you can get up to a temperature of 670. From just your nuclear reactor. Yes. Go on. And then it goes to the first turbine, and the temperature comes down a bit yeah. to close to what it came out of the compressor at, right? Okay. And then you have like the same heat exchanger configuration, so okay. you're reaching the same like end temperature. Yeah. Because the temperatures are coming in the same here into the heat exchanger and going out. So like what would it look like with just a molten reactor? What would the schematic look like if it was just a molten reactor? Would it just be... Like with the Brayton cycle? No, no, just a molten reactor. Like if, if you just had a standalone nuclear reactor, what would, it, what would the schematic look like? Oh, um, well that would be different because it would be a Rankine cycle, right? It would be a steam cycle. Okay, so the, the coolant would be heating up, not air, but steam. Yeah, so in a, in a regular like conventional plant that's operating today, you would have um, all of the nuclear heat generating steam, and this would look like, mm -hmm. I mean, it would basically look similar to this on your TS diagram, but efficiencies are way lower with converting heat to steam and generating electricity that way. Okay. Um, what, would, what would the efficiency look like if you just cut out the added fuel from the Natural gas. And do that comparison. Just like from the natural gas. Um, just cut it out, and what is efficiency? Yeah, it's like, like just run more. It's like forty-two percent shipping. Yeah. So could you just run natural gas at all the time? And you could if you had. Yeah, if I mean, if you were going to use all of that energy, but right. because you have to match supply and demand. Yeah. So you, you can, can use the, the the natural gas to like be flexible on how yeah. how how your temperature I mean, is going. I'm assuming 1200 is maybe like your max as high mm -hmm. as you can get. Yeah. But you could sort of. Yeah, so you can you stop you anywhere between 670. Yeah, you don't have to start it, stop at 670, but you could run it much hotter. Be more hotter efficient. than 1200? Hotter than 670, just in general, by continuously adding natural gas. Yes. You would just have less room, basically. That's your wiggle room, the amount of natural gas you have. Yeah, that's your. Flexibility. This is your, like, in between base load and peak load. Does that make sense? Intermediate but like the higher the temperature you go, the more efficient you'll run all the time. Uh, yeah. So. Well, I think so. It's, well, I think it's close actually. But the, the efficiency should still always be like really high if you're using any natural gas at all, comparing that to like a standalone natural gas system because you're still starting at such high temperatures to begin with. And yeah, high temperatures in like thermodynamics basically always correspond with higher efficiencies as a general statement. And so is the fluoride salt in direct contact with those graphite bubbles? No, so it goes through heat exchange. Yeah, it goes through the heat exchangers. So the air, oh wait, sorry, yes. So, if there was a breach in that heat exchanger, the fluoride salt would. Do you go next slide? Uh, just think about safety now. Like, mm -hmm. so, you mean if like the heat exchanger broke and. Yeah, so like, like, Peter has like, two, they had like two closed systems for the, the PWR, right? Mm -hmm. So this one, you have your, you have your coolant in direct contact with your um, fuel, mm -hmm. and so then in a closed system as well, it converts it to air. Mm -hmm. So if there's a breach there, the air would get contaminated. Yeah. Which would be like terrible. Yeah, but I mean, this is like not a new concept in yeah. reactor technologies, right? They, they, you just have to have like really solid components. Yeah, so the air would be contaminated with what? Radiation? That's Radi not a thing. <laughs> with the, the <coughs> molten, yeah, it would have like radioactive particles in it. It wouldn't be a gas. No, it wouldn't be a gas. But, but it would have particles have... that could be carried by yeah. air. Like because the 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 it wouldn't be within the containment center of the main the main reactor. So it's yeah. housed in an uncontained area. So regardless, and then combine that with 
No, that's not right. This sort of explains. I know. You, no, I realize what you're saying, but it's also you can't disregard having contaminated fluoride salt in a non-contained environment. It's still radioactive. Yeah, the whole point of it getting out is. But actually, not in the like, air I'm, not, well, I'm not super out. sure on this, but I think actually but the radioactive, well, like the the radioactive fission products, are still contained in the pebble. And I don't know how good the graphite is at like shielding that. Okay, I think it's, I think it's interesting if you, com you combine it with a highly combustible fuel source, natural gas. Oh, but when the natural gas part is like miles away. So is it? That's what I was going to yeah. ask. Because I just saw like a video yesterday of some Texas yeah. plant like blowing up. Yeah, no, like the, the natural gas doesn't influence the reactor at all. It's and, miles and away. And it can be like really far apart. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so it's like hopefully a safe, like a non issue from that point of view because they're still like separate systems. How do you transport? Like Just underground, we have like ducts. Yeah. And that's hot air that's being carried in between the two plants, not hot fluoride. Yeah, hot air. <laughs> <laughs> Is it efficient to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're just. I mean, it's less efficient than having it right there, but safety probably overrides it. Yeah. I think you're starting to say that you're doing all the research. Uh, maybe. Yeah. So I'm, I'm staying on with the same group for my PhD, and I might continue working on like a different aspect of the same project, or I might work on a different project. That has to do with like reactor materials or even like waste containment. So that like I mean safety is kind of an important part of any of these types of analysis because it's it's part of the system that you analyze. Yeah. So, so in terms of actually implementing the system, so there are lots of new reactor designs. So, but there. yeah, but that that but none of them have actually used. There haven't so really been all that many new new reactors built. It's yeah, so I mean, in the US, the yeah, the reactors the have had an interesting history. They, they were like pretty popular in the US and the UK in like the 70s and 80s, and then a lot of them have become old. And in the US, there's a lot of talk of just refitting the old ones with new components so they can keep going, they can get up to like 80 or 100 years old, even. Um, if you just, you know, change out the components. Um, but in the UK, well, and then after the Fukushima disaster, like nuclear energy has been really controversial. So a lot of projects that were started just before the disaster were then like canceled. Um, but there seems to be interest seems to be picking up again because people are realizing that if you like maintain your reactors properly, the risk is is really low or comparable to like fossil fuel plants. So are there like test reactors of? of are there like liquid fluoride there, and double bed tests? Yeah, yeah so. there are. I don't really get how this works, but um, it sounds really cool. There's yeah, there's one at Berkeley, so a lot of this work is being done at Berkeley, and I think they they use these test reactors to test like certain small aspects of the configuration, but I don't really think it's possible to test the entire system. I don't, I'm not really sure. I'm still reading about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of the work has to be computational because reactors are really expensive to build and you can't just like build it and then find out if something went wrong. So, just to ask the AP, the obvious AP question mm -hmm. for these two is obvious. If you could live for another 100,000 years or something, or you would see your children then, what do you think? Would you sit down and go, like, oh, it was a good idea to go ahead with nuclear power and, you know, was stupid to ever think about solar cells, or would you think, oh, you know, how could we ever go down that road? We should have turned to solar power straight away. Or so, something. like, the most important thing I've learned from this year, taking all these classes in energy technologies, is that there's no, like, one right answer. You have to balance all of these different technologies um, and use them together. I understand that it's very little waste. But it seems like the longest term is waste, right? Mm -hmm. And so I mean, there are like the fusion is being developed, and like maybe it'll never happen, but maybe it's just a couple of decades away, and that's like there's there's what there's no waste from fusion or what? Well, know. there's Water. there's Water. reactor yeah. containment vessels which become highly radioactive after a few you know yeah. years of nuclear bombardment, mm -hmm. and there's all the plasma that you have to contain. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the amounts that are coming out of reactors, even over long periods of time, like still seem to be quite 
manageable. I'd say the more like, as you put it, like the answer would definitely to go with nuclear, just because the immediate solution, like the immediate urgency of this growing CO2 in the atmosphere is much more dangerous and it could have ill effects in the, past, in the next 100 years compared to 10,000 years down the road. And so a lot of people see nuclear power as a stopgap measure until renewables can really like meet all of our energy needs. Um, <coughs> oh, a stopgap solution than coal. Yeah, yeah coal. Yeah. Coal. And the only reason that, that and the whole issue of renewables right now is just like what we should say on top, the battery issue, which is not to be understated because we have virtually zero yeah, energy uh, storage is storage. like not really viable right now. Like the technology we have, there are some that work, but in most cases, like they can only store like a day's, they can only store that electricity for a day. So if you have like a week of no wind and no sun, you're, you've already used up any electricity that you had stored or like in the opposite scenario, if you try to store it for a longer time, it's just going to like dissipate into the environment in the form of heat and then it's not usable anymore. Yeah. Have you heard of, um, this is not my field of expertise in any way, but have you heard of Elon Musk's power pack or whatever? It's this new battery. You know, I, you know, yeah, I've here. heard of it, but I haven't okay. read anything about it in detail. I think it's like, yeah. no. no, I was just going to say, like, I think, I mean, probably not a novel concept, but this idea is basically like solar panel every house in the U.S. and then have these power packs so that you can take every house off the grid. I'm trying to use batteries like super awesome or something. Yeah, I don't know anything about battery, but I there are a lot of issues with... The battery is not new in any way. The battery is the exact same battery that's used everywhere else. So there's nothing special about the battery. This is just making a big one that hangs on the wall. Um, yeah. the, the difference that it can make is that it, if it... So it could be completely off the grid, which is fine, but all, so all it serves there, rather than having really energy storage for this, is just if the power goes out, your house alone will have some power for like the next hours or day. Um, it could, if it gets integrated into the grid, what it would do is it would, if enough people have these, right, if every house actually had one, then you could have a system where the grid could store enough energy by using these things in people's homes um, to store that like, excess renewable energy that's produced. This is just sort of like a way of having, instead of a county or a, you know, a city government buying a bunch of these, if you sort of had one in your house for your own reasons, but then you also left it connected to the grid so that it could be basically be filled up with renewable energy all the time and allowed them to use it. It'd be like this peak loading stuff that I was just talking about there. So it could help renewables, but it's not currently set up. A, the battery technology is not new anyway, so it's just big ones on the wall. Yeah. B, it isn't currently going to help anything with renewables, it's just going to help you. And even if we have 300 million of them, I don't even know if that would still meet yeah. the, the demand. And just the cost of, of putting that in every Because we have battery technology, like you said, and so what's stopping us from doing that on its economics? And so yeah. it's not going to change. Well, and these batteries are just as expensive and toxic as all the old ones, so there's nothing. There's no reason that this this shouldn't be the battery that gets put on every wall. No, it's works. kind of his just. But it's just small. you're just always talking about demand and economics, economic, economics. Yeah. Well, you know, well, so also, so also, also wind power and salt power is like very low energy dense, and so if you look at it, how much the world's currently using, it's only like total renewables is like two percent. And that's after and it, all this huge. It works like kind of well in like really sunny countries because yeah. then you're you're like making electricity most of the time, so you don't need as much land area. But in countries that aren't as consistently sunny, you just need like huge farms to make any sort of difference to your overall energy mixture. And like a lot of countries, like Britain is an island. There, there is no more land. Like. You don't have a lot of land for even wind turbines. Like this is an issue where people just don't like wind turbines. But then um, you can't even put the waste anywhere if you just don't have any land, right? But you can so put the waste somewhere else. The waste where is also tight. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like it's really put it next door, right? If you kind of need a big area inside. Big yeah, but we have landfills. But like it's quite similar to. Uh, I think it's just it's just the the orders of magnitude difference between. Yeah. Yeah, like the waste is really, really tiny. So 
just have to be really, really careful and not let it leak out for the next 100,000 years. Yeah. And there's work by being done with this, too. I don't think another way to think of it is, um, you remember a few days ago when the power got out of the Wilson Flats, how many people you know, were like, uh, oh, my dinner's cold in the oven, I can't do anything. Yeah, if, if that were to happen regularly, no. Nothing yeah, like, if you had a cloudy work. week, and none of these houses are like in a city, none of the houses were able to generate electricity. Like, you just can't do that. But even the amount of wind turbines that get power a city like London, even if they're at peak capacity, would be insanely huge. Mm -hmm. And then you get very high losses from having, let's say, we're going to put them all in France and just, we're just going to put a, a line, <laughs> line which people are doing. H, people, yeah, so we're trying to make this super European connected networks, all right? So we should say there's certain areas that are better than others, like Spain's really sunny. So they're putting and lines under water. Northern Africa is really sunny, not very many people, people live there, so. Exactly, so they're actually yeah, trying people to. people are actually suggesting things like this. They are, and, they're, and the UK is doing it itself. So it's very windy in northern, northern UK. And so they're making these very large lines that go from north all the way to London to use this this offshore wind power we're generating and onshore wind power generating. So it was like about half the power in the process. But and you lose a lot, right? And so you, you Well, the, the new like high voltage ones are, yeah. are, are like relatively efficient. Yeah, so they're, they're definitely working towards like something like that. But even then, even then, the magnitude, there's still only like 2%. Yeah, like the amount oh, that you can generate in the first place. Like, it's a big amount, but it's a small amount compared to the demands, the energy Shoot that's being small. used. So, like it's gigawatts versus kilowatts. Yeah, and there are advances being made in renewables all the time. So I'm not saying we should forget about renewables, but it's not like it's not going to solve the entire problem by itself. And I think just that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, using, using nuclear as like well, the base load. I'm, I'm not a big fan of renewables in the sense that I do think they're issues as well. I'm just you know the urgency I think of global warming overpowers the ten thousand view outlook, which is why Bill Gates, his only other like venture is a nuclear power company, because he just realizes the urgency and the, the technology we have now, if we deploy it, would have much better ramifications than working 10,000 years on the road. So it's like you said, it's kind of a stopgap until we yeah. have these other technologies. These are all like really hard questions in energy, like how do you balance the immediate future versus the long-term future, and like people disagree hugely. Um. The nuclear is highly efficient with like no waste, I mean, no air pollution whatsoever, yeah. essentially. Yeah, you so. should be way more concerned about coal, which is killing tens of thousands of people every year. I'm not saying I'm not concerned about coal. Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. saying. So, I feel yeah, that's so like when Germany shut down all its nuclear power plants, mm -hmm. now they're using more coal or just nuclear power from France. So it's so killing so. citizens, so essentially. This Thanks for the problem. Like coal guns. This yeah, problem is not only limited to energy, maybe from your opinion about the food of the food storage, how do we solve this problem? And some people say well, that the food distribution gene, right? the same thing, right? gene mutation food, and there are still concerns about that kind of food. So it's a dilemma of uh, the right. yeah. 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 And like, if you wanted to avoid all these problems, we could just stop using energy, but when is that going to happen? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. Could we, you know, Looking 50 years back or something, we'll probably be able to power everything by renewable energies. Yeah, I mean, energy I'm not use saying that I don't. I want to go back 50 years and you know they confiscate our all our stuff and I don't know we are allowed to watch TV once a week for one hour all together in the walks and feed or something. <laughs> 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 yeah, this is another thing that people disagree on a lot in energy use. Like, there's a lot in energy engineering is like how much can demand reduction make a difference versus just like finding new ways of supplying more energy and some people like we have this one professor who thinks that we can all just like drive smaller cars and turn off our lights and stuff and and but there are a lot of like more extreme measures that it just never it just doesn't seem feasible that like people are going to agree to this or ever like do it they're never going to do it voluntarily right and it's how do you force people to use less energy? Because energy is also correlated with GDP, so countries don't really have an incentive to like reduce their overall energy use because if it means reducing their GDP, that's like GDP is a higher priority, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Professor. Trump. I mean, conceivably, developed countries could afford at this point to reduce their GDP or like have it level off, but it's just such a like a like a power game 
in the world economy, who has like a growing GDP and who doesn't, and who has like who's catching up with who. Like all of these things. Who is the are already the, the already developed UK? Like how are they able to say, hey, in developing countries, you must develop only through low carbon technologies, whereas our entire history was full of coal, right? <laughs> it's, kind of like unfair, it's kind of unfair to say that. But, but the you reason the UK and like, US are leading really, really because they have the means to start developing this technology, so eventually they'll be able to economically deploy it to those other developed countries. Because, right? Yeah, so, so China, the hope is that, and they don't sell us the technology. That's the problem. What's that? We have us. some new technology for sustainable development, but China cannot buy it. We That's want to, good. yeah, we want to. Oh, nuclear technology, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to interrupt for just.